All right, folks, it's Bradley J. the Bradcast, and we are with the great Carter Allen of WZLX and WBCN fame, and also an author. I don't, I don't know, maybe author is the primary thing now. I don't know which is most important to you, but you have a couple books, Carter. First, thanks for being with me, with us. Remind folks about the book and I, books, and I understand that they are sold out, but they can be had somehow. Yeah. Well, hi, Bradley. Always great to be with you. Great to see you. My my uh, fellow compatriot at WBCN back in the day. Um, so I wrote a book about WBCN, uh, Radio Free Boston, and that is currently out of print, but there are still copies on Amazon. Uh, they still have an inventory there. I wrote a book called Decibel Diaries, which is my favorite 50 concerts. That's out of print. The publisher went out of business, and so I'm getting that all sorted out. It takes a bit. It's kind of like a band that has an album. You know, their record label contract goes out, and they have to figure out how to put it out again. Uh, so that is out there. You know, I would send people to eBay. I know they think, well, you're not getting any money from a resale. That's okay. I mean, uh, I wrote the books mainly for fun anyway. Uh, and the YouTube book is still out there. You can get a copy on Amazon or Lulu.com. They print to order. A download is always available instantly. And then I also wrote a book about Dinky Dawson years ago, which is which is a uh, it's a hard to find item. So if you have to pay one hundred and fifty bucks for it, it's worth it because it's hard to hard to get. <laughs> I, rem- I, I remember Dinky Dawson from the channel and uh, That's the he was, uh, he's always very cool and uh, he, he would share his thoughts uh, freely. Yeah, well, he's, you know, he had quite a history. He went back, he was an original roadie for Fleetwood Mac when that band started, 1967. And he was on the London scene as a DJ. He was a, he was an in-club DJ, you know, spinning those swinging London 60s songs. And then got into rock and roll. He worked for Jay Giles' band, The Kinks. He worked for John McLaughlin. And he's a, he's a sound guy. And he puts sound systems in everywhere and rents out equipment now. And that book... Uh, that I wrote for him, the the amazing rock and roll adventures of Dinky Dawson. He's actually uh, putting an audio version of it together, and uh, actually has Mick Fleetwood, who who wrote the forward, actually voicing some of it. So wow. yeah, that'll be coming up in the future. Dinky will definitely let the world know. Now that you're more efficient in your radio job, you have a little more time. Any thoughts of writing another book, or is that just too much work? It's it, of course it's more work than anyone realizes by yeah. far. Uh, are you going to quit while you're ahead or what? Um, I, I just, for a long time, I really uh, relished not writing a book, uh, finishing a lot of things around the house that I needed to do. Um, but I, I, I kind of really would like to write a, write something again. But the hard part for me is coming up with something to write about. I have to write about something that's going to, you know, drag you away from your day-to-day chores and get you up early so you can get a a lot of work done before your day starts to catch up with you. Right. Um, I mean, I'm usually good at five in the morning and writing for about four hours and then things start happening and I have to deal with it. Um, So in the choice between writing a music book, another music book, I mean, I've got a really good idea, which I started working on and uh, or developing a novel from some ideas that I've had in the past, you know, so yeah, I'm kind of getting around to the point where I really have the itch to write another book. It's novels it's, really hard, I guess, right? Dr- writing, writing, writing dialogue yeah. you can get lost in and not f- feel the writer is super difficult. Yeah. Well, when you say something is gone, right? If I if I totally screwed up right now and said something wrong, it would it would be gone. I mean, people might have the recording of it and you'll rebroadcast it, but when you write a book, you know, it's it's eternal. But the advantage is you can go over something again and again and massage it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a danger in that too. You could like rub out your original, you know, edginess and and massage it to something really average. Um, but hopefully you would recognize that. Or you can change something. Or at the end of a chapter, you could say, you know, this doesn't work where it is in the book. It needs to go later. And then you have to make adjustments. So I really enjoy the compositional aspects of writing. I enjoy working with the language and messing with the words. Obviously, I'm not as adept as some people. Of course, we could say that in any business. There's always somebody better than you. I'm no Stephen King, I know, um, but I really do enjoy the writing. Um, and, you know, the, the books that I write are not going to be New York Times bestsellers. So I'm really kind of doing it for fun. 
You know, I, I made some money in the YouTube book, but the other books, you know, it's basically it's fun to do. I enjoy it. And it's a great sense of accomplishment. Speaking of having a little more time, being more efficient at your job uh, due to technology, that gives you a little more time to do things like travel. And that's really why you're, why you're here. You've recently been able to go on two trips with your lovely wife. And we're here to share uh, these uh, these images and stories. I saw you at Come Together, Chachi Lepret's, uh Beatles extravaganza, and we chatted and I, about your trips. And I said, boy, I sure would like to hear about them. I figured we might as well share it with everybody, so that's what we're doing. So you went on a couple trips. You went to Switzerland, and you went to the Christmas markets of Germany. Right. We'll do Switzerland first. But before we get to the pictures, how do you decide on where you're going? Because that's kind of tough. You, you yeah. got a trip. You want it to be the best, most wonderful thing. And you got to kind of say, oh, do I want to go here? No. And, and here... No, what I do is I watch a lot of YouTube videos on these places. How do you decide on on where you're going to go? Yeah. Well, of course, marriage is a partnership and you want to go someplace that, you know, I want to go somewhere where my wife wants to go. Um, and when one day we had this idea, and this was a few years ago, I said, where would you want to go? And we both came up with a list, the top 10 things, places that we've heard about that we've never gone to. And this was in the wake of going to Iceland back in 2015. That trip opened our eyes to wanting to visit places, you know, and get up, get away from America and see places overseas. And so we came up with these lists and top of each list was Switzerland. And I said, I said, Carrie, you want to go to Switzerland? She goes, yeah. And I said, I keep seeing, you know, these, they say the way to go is by train. Um, and so since it was on the top of our lists, we started investigating that. And I came across a company called Vacations by Rail. And it's actually an American company, which is partnered with a British company. And um, they offer all kinds of trips, not only, you know, overseas, but also in America. There's great train trips out in Canada and the Rockies and, you know, to the southwest. And they do train trips down in New Zealand, too, and in Vietnam. So, I mean, it's a good way to get around quickly. You know, I mean, if you... You go and visit places quickly on a trip, on a train trip. And then if you want, you can go back and go to these places and spend time there specifically. So in some ways, it's a Whitman sampler, but it's a, it's a lot of fun to do. What was it again? Uh, I'm writing it down. Vacations by rail? Vacations by rail, yeah. And I think the British company is called Great Rail Adventures. It's okay. a partnership. Uh, but if you, if you Google vacations by rail, you'll get all of their uh, information, and then they'll probably be sending you emails for life that's all right that's the way it goes. were you happy were you happy with them and what's what's included uh well um yeah i was very happy i mean you get the rail trip obviously but you get your um your hotels where you're going to stay this trip originated in london and you take the, we took the train through the channel uh past paris down to uh um, strasbourg and we stayed overnight there and then from there we went into switzerland and we based ourselves in a town called Coeur. And after three days, we went on to another town called Kandersteg. And in their case, you know, you get a certain number of meals, almost all the meals, actually. You get your hotel stays, you get the train trip, and you get the, um, if there's any, you know, um, excursions, that stuff you do extra on your own. Okay. And you book your own flights, though, which I like because I don't trust travel companies to get me good flights. You know, I'm afraid they're going to give me flights with two legs or long layovers. So I, I'm kind of glad to book my own flights. Yeah. Well, a couple of our trips, we, we actually um, use overseas uh, travel companies, uh, British companies. And so you, you, all the trips originate from England. So you have to get there. Right. Uh, so yeah, I agree. You know, and, and if you book far enough ahead, you can get really very um, – reasonable flights you know I, I happen to like jet blue uh as opposed to we we flew british air american i found jet blue to be a little bit better in price and uh, as far as getting your bags on the plane without having to pay extra for it okay so let's do this let's uh show some photos and have you tell us about them so you <clears throat> you got to england uh, where do you want to where does the trip begin does it begin in Kerr, as you mentioned well, you yeah, you take once you get. I'm going to get to photo number one here. 
Okay, that's, uh, yeah. So we're uh, traveling on the Bernina Express, which is a narrow gauge railway. That's the Bernina Express. And it goes from Cor, C-H-U-R, down to Pasciavo, which is uh, in the south of Switzerland. I mean, there's a couple different regions of Switzerland. There's a, an Austrian Switzerland. There's a French-influenced Switzerland. And this goes down to the Italian-influenced. And you know the Switzerland that you have in your mind are these gingerbread type houses and, you know, Heidi, you know, the, the movie, that sort of look to it. But you get down to the south of Switzerland, it really looks like Italy. And it's really cool to go through that change. But the, the scenery you drive, you go through, you know, drive, but the scenery you go through is just breathtaking. You go through the Bernina Pass here and there's, mm. there's glaciers all over the place. And incidentally, um, these trips are all available in the wintertime. A lot of people like to go in the winter. And you can see it in this photo at the front of the train. You can see that looks like a fence over the train. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge snow fence. And there are some of these passes, you'll see 20 or 30 rows of snow fences. And um, it's incredibly incredible how meticulous the Swiss are regarding the rail system. They are, they are inspecting these trains all the time. Uh, I know some of their trains are cog trains. They inspect those cog trains every day. Um, I generally have found the train system to be far superior to American rail. Uh, I mean, some of these trains you take, they go 150 miles an hour, and it, it, it's better than being on the green line downtown. Um, so um, you feel very confident and very safe taking the rail. So let me know when you want to change photos. I guess this is a good time. What do we see here? Well, the end, I just wanted to show how, how the visibility you have from inside the windows. I mean, you can see everywhere. And since a lot of the a lot of the scenery is up because the mountains are so incredible in the Alps. You can see far up. The only drawback is this particular time it was cloudy, which is, you know, you start getting reflections. That's a hard, that's a hard thing to deal with, you know, when you're taking camera shots and mm -hmm. you got a reflection. So, um, but you know, that's the way that it is what it is, but you have your tables, you have bar service, you know, they, they feed you on some of the longer journeys, it's very comfortable and you can get regular rail. You can also get first class. We were lucky enough to get first class in the Bermina, which was booked for us. Do you f feel like the, the windows in this particular train, the Bernina Express, are bigger than I, I, I believe there are probably trains, regular rail trains that go on the same tracks and the same see the same stuff, but yeah. they don't have big windows like this, right? No. I mean, there's a lot of local trains like, you know, it's like our commuter rail. Um, I mean, you'll see regular trains pulling out of the station all the time. It's people going to work in the next town or needing to get across Switzerland. I mean, the Europeans rely on their rail system a lot more than we do. I mean, we have obviously years and years ago made the move towards more the automobile. But over in Europe, the rail system is still you know, prime, one of the primary, maybe the primary way of getting around. So, I mean, we found... You know, when we went to London or to England, when we wanted to get around, you know, that part of England, we don't even worry about not having a rental car because there's a train that goes everywhere. And it's the same thing in Switzerland. So people are moving about the country all the time, just regular commuter rail. Wow. Let's go to the next uh, photo. Oh, by the way, what kind of beer did the Swiss drink? What was prominent? What kind of beer? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not so certain. I actually have a couple close-ups. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, you get Heineken, but there's some local beers too. What do we have here, Carter? Well, this is Pasiavo. This is this is after we've come through the Bernina Pass, and now we're coming down to Pasiavo, which if that's the lake, and just beyond the lake there, that's Italy. You know, it it, it Switzerland Alps flow right into the Swiss into the Italian Alps. And here's a pass that you can uh, go into. And the, 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 the rail, it's incredible how far down the train actually comes. It's several hundred feet coming down the hill on switchbacks. And then you roll into Pasciavo. And it's a beautiful town, but you could easily believe you're in Italy at this point when you're this far south. Do you get to stay uh, in any of the towns? Uh, or is it a straight shot in this Bernina Express? You stay on the train the whole time. 
No, we got out. We had, I mean, we had limited time. We only had like an hour and a half. We went into town, had a meal, of course, here in Italy. So we had pizza. Uh, and that's the train station in Pasciavo. Um, and, and, you know, so we had time to, to look around, take pictures. I mean, I took tons and tons of pictures. My wife took twice as much as I did. Um, there's a lot to look at. And, uh, you know, generally, like I said, it's a Whitman sampler, these train trips. You stay in each town for a limited amount of time. Sometimes it's only 45 minutes. It, you know, it could be a whistle stop. But um, you get to see the area and then move out. And if you want to come back to any particular place, like if I was going to go take in northern Italy, you know, I would go back to Pasciavo and, and spend a, a night or two there and then move my way south. Uh, because now I've experienced this town. Um, but you can see everything's very clean. You know, in, in Switzerland, they make a joke that if you throw a piece of, like if you put a piece of gum in your mouth and throw the wrapper on the ground, a Swiss person will come running across the street and pick it up. It's incredible how clean everything is. And the fact that they do have people that police the area and keep things clean. But you can see they didn't just do that specially for us when we arrived. It certainly doesn't look like a, a train stop here in uh in America. Where so it's usually, part of the culture, you'd say, is is it's not cool to, to litter and, and it's very cool to be clean. Yeah, it's very much, a, a, I think, an environmentally uh, leaning uh, culture. They realize the fragility of what's around them. I mean, they are watching the melting of their glaciers with worry, um, but they try to use sustainable uh, fuels as much as possible. They just... They just seem to be much more aware and uh, future thinking than we are here in America. I mean, we're coming around, but they, that seems like where we're getting to. They've been there for many years. OK, let's move to the next interesting photo here. We have oh. uh, it looks kind of like the the prisoner. Remember the show, The Prisoner? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're taking us out. Well, so I was telling you earlier that when we came uh, from Coeur through the Bernina Pass, into Pasciavo in the south on the Bernina Express that I had problems with taking pictures because you were getting all these reflections. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed all these Brits, because there was a lot of Brits with us on our trip, they were walking to the back of the train and they weren't coming back. And this is on our way back from Pasciavo because we went back the way we came. And I said, I asked them, well, where are you going? I said, there's open cars in the back. So, I mean, I don't think in America they would allow this. I'm sure there's many uh, rules here that are being broken that you can't actually sit out in an open car like this. But the weather had gotten very nice. It was really sunny. So we went back there and we took pictures of everything on the way back that we had problems with, you know, with the reflections taking on the way there. We took this train, we took this back to St. Moritz and from there back to Core. But it's just great being outside. And in the summertime, it was a beautiful day. It was, uh, the weather was, you know, it was in the 60s, um, 50s sometimes at the high points. Um, again, obviously, in the wintertime, there'd be nothing like this. You'd be bundled up inside. As you're, you know, uh, spending time in a place like Switzerland, is there a, a general vibe you, you feel it's different from the united states and that's probably something difficult to explain but you are good with words and you probably thought about it is there an overall well you start to have a different sort of generalized feeling or yeah. ambient feeling how would you describe it i just think uh people are a lot calmer over there and more considerate um i mean here in america it's it's kind of like we're we're the guy in the Hawaiian shirt with the dice in his hand at the crap table with a roll of dollar bills, hundred dollar bills in his fingers. It's vastly generalized view of American culture, but we're all very profit, very energetic, but profit oriented, very energetic, uh, a lot of competition. That's the way America is young and brash. And, you know, and we're out there fighting in, in, in Europe. It's just, they've been around for, you know, thousands of years longer than we have. They, are more cons uh, considerate of each other. The cultures are more, more socialist. So there's more in the way of um, government services coming back to the people. The parks are taken care of. The rail system, as I mentioned, is in better shape. Um, and it just seems that people feel more, 
I think, less competitive there. And you can feel that spirit. It's much more easy, I think, to relax over there. Uh, and I find that with the, the British as well. Um, and you don't really realize it while you're here until you get there, right? Exactly. I mean, you get into a big city, there's a certain spirit of competitiveness, you know, in any big city. So, you know, if you're in the middle of London, there is a certain element of London, which does resemble New York City. But generally, I find the Londoners to be a lot more laid back. Um, and they love to talk, you know, which is which is great. All right. What do we have here? Okay, so we um, we we uh, went back to Coor and then we took a train to uh, a town called, oh, excuse me, we took a train to Brig, which is a central rail uh, hub. And we got on the Glacier Express, or as the, uh, the Brits call it, the Glacier Express. They don't say glacier in England, they say glacier. We were corrected. <laughs> and so the Glacier Express um, is just this wonderful ride down to Brig, and you go through um, um, the uh, Oberalp Pass, which is this famous pass, takes you into ski country, and there's tons of glaciers. Obviously, the train is named after that. Big windows again, so you can take pictures. Uh, and we go out to Brig and, and then uh, came back. This is a wider gauge rail, um, but it's, and you can see it's electric. Um, but there's, there was a couple of stops there, and we had a chance to really stretch our legs and take a lot of pictures. And you would love it because, you know, we're old skiers and we've been skiing. But here in, <laughs> here in the east, you know, you ski and there's your slope in front of you and there's two or three lifts going up. But you take the train into these towns um, like Andermatt is this great town. The town's in the middle of this bowl, and literally there are – gondolas and lifts going in every direction. And in the wintertime, you can ski anywhere. There's no set places. You can ski anywhere you want into town. You can go three miles that way and come back into town, three miles the other direction. It's, 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 I wouldn't even know what to do with skiing like that. It's because it blows my mind. You can go anywhere. Looks like the folks have seen something interesting out the window. Oh, no, another train, it looks like. is. What, what are we seeing here? Well, let's see. There's my wife in the background there with the blonde hair. She's trying to get a shot of something. I wanted to give an idea of the the observation. They got the observation windows up top, and you can look up because so much of the scenery is so high, so you can take pictures up through those windows and out the side. We were uh, going through the Ober Alp Pass at that point, and as men I didn't – put a picture of this in, but there's those snow fences I was mentioning. And literally on this slope is 20 or 30 snow fences going up. And you really lose your perspective as to how far up they go until we were looking. We saw this tiny helicopter, which is replacing one of the fences up there, um, you know, because of the constant avalanche danger. In some of the worst areas, they actually have tunnels that are open on the outside that the train goes through. So if there is an avalanche. The snow will go over the train and off into the lake, which is right next to the train tracks. Now, but, those, sorry, those things over the back of the seats, those are paper and they get replaced, right? What's what's that? Over the, the white things on the back of the seats, those are paper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those are what? for, you know, for the every customer that comes in. Yeah, they're very conscious. You know, you know what? If you've ever taken a, a, a cruise now, uh, they they have all these stations where there's misting. There's misting stations where you can uh, sanitize your hands. They have those on the trains as well. Oh, okay. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. And there's the overall pass, which is the famous pass going on the Glacier Express. And, you know, the views are just unbelievable. I mean, you find yourself taking so many pictures of the mountains and you get home going, God, another mountain shot. And, you know, that's just an incredible picture of the Alps. Um, as you go through them. Uh, Speaking of a, incredible pictures of the Alps. Well, here, now, we're, we're, this is the Groner Grot Railway. You get out to Zermatt, and you get on the Groner Grot, which is a cog railway, which takes takes you up to 10,000 feet. And obviously, it is where you can observe the Matterhorn. And this, my wife actually took this picture. Uh, this is on the train going up. 
and this shows the altitude and the time and um it's it's a breathtaking journey there's some some pictures here the next picture i think shows you the cog railway yeah so you can see there on the on the to uh, uh between the two rails there's the cog that engages and they inspect these trains every day uh to make sure there's no wear on the cogs um and so we're on our way up and it takes you up to 10,000 feet and you know, I haven't been to 10,000 feet before, and I consider myself pretty pretty much in shape. I mean, I walk and every day, but up at 10,000 feet, you know, you still get a little winded. Didn't you go to Crested Butte? Yeah, that was like, I think, 6,000. Oh, I don't know, man. Okay, Six, if you say 68, so. Maybe, know, maybe. maybe at the very top of the of the mountains was was 10,000, but we, never, of course, never went to the top. You're right. I, I don't know how high, but I do remember... Even there was difficult, you know, walking upstairs with ski boots was really difficult. Yeah. Okay, well, like, this, I, I love this photo. What's this? Yeah, this is, well, this is the Gorner Grat Railway. This is the summit. You come up to the station up there. Uh, that is one of their older cars, which is off on a siding. And um, if you were looking for the Matterhorn, it's not in this picture. The Matterhorn is actually to the left. And we listened to a local who said, because we took a train up, uh, mid morning, probably let's say nine o'clock, ten o'clock in the morning, and he told us take your pictures as soon as you get up there, because uh, the clouds roll in on the Matterhorn usually in the afternoon, and you could see when people were coming up in the early afternoon because we stayed up there for a couple hours. Um, you know the clouds were rolling in over the Matterhorn. Um, so one of the locals said it's the matter without the horn. Uh, which is true. You can only see the bottom of it. Well, that seems like a spectacular trip. And overall, you're you're pleased with vacations by rail. Uh, yeah, folks. This, this is a site. This is you get into Zermatt, which is you know Zermatt is a. It's one of them towns where in the winter time, uh, like right now, there probably be ten thousand people in town. It's all ski chalets and you know Airbnbs and you know it's a thriving crazy town in the winter and it's much less filled during the summertime but there's still a thriving tourist business in the summer people are i mean there's another photo coming up where you'll see people waiting at the stop to get a train down there's a lot of people up there uh on top is that that, that one, one right, yeah, yeah right there um you're surrounded you're, you're on top of this viewing area and this is not on top of the matterhorn itself you're a few miles away but you can see 12 glaciers from where you stand and this is july so imagine what it would be like in in the winter time um and their trains you know they are probably the best in the world at removing snow their trains run 12 months a year so they're going up to the summit of this mountain even in the middle of the in the middle of winter okay and so that was the uh the alpine trip and there's another one folks we're going to deal with is equally interesting and uh I had some idea about the Alps, but your next trip really surprised me. And in Germany, Germany seems so cool. Folks, uh, Carter and his lovely wife went to visit uh, the Christmas markets in Germany. I'm really looking forward to hearing about these in, these towns and these markets. Is it okay to switch up and, and take us to Germany? Sure. Okay, boom. We're in Germany. <laughs> boom. You're Look in at that. So you're in Frankfurt right there. Um, okay. Wow. And and you can you can get to Frankfurt directly if you want. Uh of course uh, they, they really charge you a lot. It's funny. That you have to pay more to go a shorter distance if you take a direct flight, I guess, because of the demand, but it kind of bums me out. And I would ask the people that if anybody that works for the city of Boston that's in charge of their Christmas markets to watch this because um they get it in Germany, and we don't really get it here. We're kind of, we're getting better, but we got we have a long way to go before we get anywhere close to Germany. So, um, you know, make us feel this picture, this photo here. Look at it, just fabulous. Well, my wife suggested that she wanted to. We'd always looked at those Rhine cruises, and there's so many ads, and she wanted to visit the Christmas markets, and I didn't have so much knowledge of them. Um, and so I read up on it. We took a we took a trip. We took actually two trips, 
and both of them originated in Frankfurt. One went north, one went south. Um, and by the way, getting into Frankfurt, uh, you've flown into Frankfurt. It's the, one of the biggest airports in the world. It's incredible. You have to allow hours extra to get anywhere. Um, but when you take the bus out of the airport and you get down to the Rhine, Frankfurt is just a, a charming city. And you have to remember, even though this looks like it's a thousand years old, a lot of Europe, and especially in Germany, was rebuilt because of the war. Uh, I mean, there was a terrible cost um, that the German people paid, uh, you know, in the end of that war with cities being destroyed. But when they rebuild something, they, re they rebuild it like it was. You know, if half the church is destroyed, they rebuild the church exactly like it was. You know, maybe the inside is all technologically changed, but outside it still looks like it did a thousand years ago. And this is a big Christmas market in Frankfurt. We really had no idea. They said we boarded our ship, which is going to leave that night and said, by the way, there's a their first Christmas market is a block down the river. Take a left. You're there. And we turned the corner and we're this is what we saw. Literally <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of people were like, wow. And it's you know, it's American markets are more commercial. Obviously, it's almost like yeah, but they're, they're, they're drawing on a tradition that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. This is how they celebrate their Christmas. They, they like to parade past stands where people sell different things. And I've got some pictures of some of the stands. There's a guy that sells pretzels. There's the people that sell meats. There's the, you know, the candy stands. There are the, there's the bars because some of these stands are temporary two-story stands that they set up and the christmas markets go on for an entire month i mean if you want a pretzel this guy's got your pretzel i mean yeah. no matter what you like um people wow. streaming by and just having a great time by the way what was the did you did you like your tour company and what was the name of that uh tour company we took was tui uh t-u-i it's a british tour company uh they okay. do not advertise in america so you need to seek them out. Now, and did you have to go pick that up in England, or did you flew to to uh, to Germany on your own? Yeah, for this uh, for this tour, we flew to one uh, to England. Uh, one of the tours emanated from Birmingham Airport. And one of them from uh, from um, where were we? Gatwick from Gatwick. Uh. So yeah, you've got to get to England. So the first part of the trip is not part of the tour. That's your business. To right. get. So how, how do you meet with the people, the group? Are they in the airport? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, they, uh, they tell you yeah. where to, where exactly to meet up and you start to see people congregating at gate number, whatever, or something like that. Exactly. You get your instructions. I mean, TUI has its own airplanes, so they have their own uh, check-in area. So you get there and you check in. And, um, you know, you know, the date and time and these airports like uh, we also emanated from uh, Stansted Airport a lot. Stansted and Birmingham, there are a lot of um, 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 uh, charter airlines uh, and, and tourist airlines like, you know, Ryanair and TUI and Titan Air. And, um, you know, so, you know, you know where to go. Um, here's the guy that's uh, selling candy. Those are all gingerbread hearts on the wall and they all have different sayings in german some of which i can read some of which i can't um and those are all great christmas presents uh, for the kids um did you get did you try one of them well we tried gingerbread yeah you know we didn't bring any of those home for gifts because we were um skeptical we thought well how's it gonna last you know it's gotta be hard as a rock when we get back to America. But we were told by people that they stay fresh and soft for a long time. So, of course, you know, you give one of one of those to a kid, it will be gone in about 20 minutes. So I guess you don't have to worry about that, right? Yeah, and lugging it home would be such a pain, right? And it might get crumbled and all. I can't imagine yeah. it. Uh, so yeah. uh, there's a comment here by a Steve Bassett who says his daughter just returned from a similar trip. She left Switzerland but found people in Germany rather gruff. Did you find that? Um, yeah, in some places, I think so. I mean, when you are involved in going to the Christmas markets, 
uh, the people that you meet are, you know, that work the stands or there are people that are, you know, passing along that are shopping in the stands and everybody's in a really good mood because it's a festive time. I suppose you could go to Germany and get into the outreaches and, you know, get into a small town and you're obviously seen as a tourist uh, and people might you know, be a little standoffish. But in this situation, I mean, there's lots of German tourists. They're tourists. They're Germans from other cities coming here to go to these markets. Uh, and when you're buying something, everybody's friendly. You yeah. know? And, and it's possible that the German language to us sounds gruff. It's very angular and all. And maybe that adds to uh, a sense of gruffness that is not intended. I, yeah. I can't I, be sure. I understand a little German. I can read a lot of German. I have a hard time speaking it, um, but people are willing to come halfway. But a lot of people speak English in these markets um, that are German. They speak English, and so or half English, and you kind of work it out, or you can, or you just buy something and um, yeah, you can point to it and and hold up one finger, and they'll tell you. <laughs> You'll see how much it is on the register, and you. Oh, you don't even need to know. You just stick your phone on the thing, and there you go. Anybody selling anything is probably going to speak English, though, right? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people speak English. Uh, and to the answer to that question, you know, definitely when you're in an English-speaking country, it's a lot or, a lot easier because if somebody is gruff, you can easily talk your way, you know, through the situation if there is a situation, or or you know, make them smile with a joke or something. Um, you know, I found that just. If people are gruff to you overseas, you just you just smile and don't be afraid of being a tourist. You know, it's oh, it's uncool being a tourist. You know, well, well, so what? I mean, you got to ask questions, and if you ask questions, you find out a lot of stuff that you would not have known, and people help you out. So, at, at, to that point, it's possible to f to find your way around, of course, using your phone. However, I find it is more rewarding to ask somebody directions is the more i think the more interaction you have the more rewarding your, your trip is and asking directions is kind of fun even if you don't you know even if you have to ask a whole bunch of people you know so even if you just have them point in the general direction because you don't understand the language hey right. i have a question about all these sausages et etc cetera, etc cetera. do the do they taste tremendous, as great as they look? Are they different than a, than the hot dog we would get around here? And can you describe the difference? Well, I'm not the guy to ask. I'm a vegetarian. Oh, right. So you didn't <laughs> taste them. But, but um, you know, I mean, Germany is known for its Wurst. There's all kinds of different flavors. Hundreds, really. Um, there was, I had a picture of a sausage stand, a Wurst stand. Uh, but I, I put this picture in because I just found the, the hanging... Um, uh, pans there, the frying pans, uh, just to be fascinating how they do that. Um, I could call it swinging steaks after one of my favorite Boston bands. Oh, right? yeah. Um, but yeah, they keep it, they keep that cooking all day for people. And, uh, but yeah, not being able to comment on the taste that you say, I mean, this yeah, is, sorry about that. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, they're known for this. So, I mean, there's sweet sausage and there's, Lebanon, bologna, everything, all kinds of different brats. Someday we'll do it. Well, someday in person, I want to talk to you more about being a vegetarian. I've actually talked to you a little bit about it, but it's very interesting to me. <clears throat> but that's not the topic for today, huh? because we're in we're in uh, in Deutschland. So oh, this yes. is yet another another town. This is Heidelberg. This is Heidelberg. Heidelberg, Heidelberg was actually an excursion with the. Uh, we, we go to, uh, we're on the Rhine, and we actually got an excursion by bus to Heidelberg, which is about th half an hour away. And they had some markets. We did a tour of the Heidelberg Castle, and then we went down below and went through uh, the market down below. Um, and I, I put this picture in just to show, I mean, a lot of the locals go to the, you know, the, the like I said, these Christmas markets have um, bars, and you buy yourself uh, spiced wine, glue wine, and uh, is red and there's white and it's heated and has you know spices in it and you drink your spiced wine and talk and that's a big part of going to the market. Uh, you sit back and and enjoy your wine. So a lot of the locals are here enjoying their wine behind this um, 
um, uh, kiosk in front of us. There was a uh, an ice skating rink for the kids. So the parents are sitting there drinking their wine while they're watching the kids on the rink. Um, and then there's there's uh, kiosks selling uh, wares. They're selling, you know, uh, porcelain. They're selling everything. They're selling food, too. And so, yeah, this was the Heidelberg market. Oh, this looks fantastic. Okay. Yeah, this is Colmar, France. Uh, and this is not far away from Heidelberg. You have to understand that you get into a certain area where you're going in and out of France and Germany regularly. You know, one moment you're in France, one moment you're in Germany. Uh, this we took a little uh, excursion to Colmar, which is about a half an hour away from the Rhine. And it really we walked into this village and it's kind of like Whoville. Uh, I mean, these these gingerbread uh, uh, houses and it's it's unbelievable, really. Uh, this is like the kind of, I don't know, magical Christmas you see in your kids' books when you're growing up. And it's actually the way these people uh, live. And they call this, this is this is how they grew up. And they do this wonderful um, Christmas market, which just kept going on and on and on for blocks. And then all of a sudden we ran out of time and had to go back to get our bus. And so now this is a place that Carrie and I want to go back to, Colmar france is the entire town like this or is this just a small center that is this charming in colmar it's a small part of it um well it's a big part of it but there is a whole um um, um a commerce a commercial part of town where there's offices and businesses and then you turn the corner and they've transformed it into this village with all these these german uh, uh, booths and kiosks, for lack of better terms, where people are selling things and they're selling their uh, spiced wine. All right. And okay. speaking of spiced wine, look at who we have here. Oh, that's my lovely wife, Carrie. And um, <clears throat> I have a glass of, of white spiced wine and she has a glass of red spiced wine. And we have some uh, crepes that we're eating. Oh. Of course, you're in France. Get a crepe when you're in France. It's a Grand Meunier crepe, and they don't skimp on the Grand Meunier. Got to really? love that. So crepes is the th is the thing if you're in in France. I can yeah. imagine. I, I I I'd like to eat about a a thousand of. They have sweet ones, right, and savory ones. Oh yeah. I mean, you get you know what's really big over there is Nutella. Yeah. You know the chocolate spread. I mean. Yep. I mean, they have like dozens of jars of it in front of all these, you know, these markets where they're making crepes. I mean, a lot of people get the Nutella crepes. Um, we happen to like the Graham and Yay crepes just because it's sweet and it warms you up and uh, gives you a lot of energy to go on to the next Christmas market. And we have a, a Cologne now. This is Cologne and there's the huge Cologne Cathedral on the upper left. Um, this is the big Christmas tree they brought in, and there's a stage in front of us where the kids do their displays, do their um, songs and their uh, little dramas, and Santa Claus comes out and sits there and sees the kids. So, um, yeah, Cologne was pretty amazing. Uh, there's a, there were three Christmas markets in Cologne. One of them was the cathedral. Then there was a Christmas market uh, at the town hall. Then there was the downtown Christmas market. I think I got a night picture of that one. Um, uh, what does that sign say? It says Weinacht market? Weinacht yes. market? What well, does Weinacht that mean? Weinacht is Christmas. Okay. So Weinacht Mark is Christmas market. Um, you know, Merry Christmas is Frohlicke Weinacht. So, um, and just remember that W's are pronounced V over there. So it's Wein. Right. And V's are pronounced with an F. Um, and Nacht, you know, so, uh, okay. oh, oh. oh yeah, these are the, uh, 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 or the Shoko Kuf. And what it is, is it's, it's like a bonbon and it's all filled with uh, marshmallow inside. Uh, and so we figured they, you know, they flavored them with whiskey like flavoring, uh, or glue vine flavoring which is spiced wine flavoring and then to the right there's a champagne one we figured it's champagne flavoring well my wife bit into hers and it exploded it's real champagne 
in there. And I had a whiskey one. It's got real whiskey in it, you know. And I fell in love with this stuff. They wanted to sell us like a box of 12 of them, but I couldn't see how to get it back to America without crushing them. Um, but we enjoyed that. It's a great little dessert. You think that somebody here would make those? <clears throat> Well, I yeah, guess. maybe, I mean, they, like I said, in France, they would make these as bonbons. And here, I mean, there is a, I can't remember the name of the brand, but there is a commercially available brand. It's like a marshmallow chocolate thing. I can't hmm. remember. Okay. And, and now we're is, in Cologne again. This is still Cologne. And this is the other Christmas market at night. And they light up the trees. And, you know, you can see the avenue with, with stands on either side. There's musicians in some of the stands. They're selling everything. You know, there are stands that sell home crafted stuff, you know, that you know, like wood products in the Black Forest, stuff you you know are is made in Germany. But there's a lot of places that that do sell stuff that's made in China. Now, nothing against that, but when I go to Germany, I don't want to buy something made in China. Like nutcrackers. If you see a nutcracker in Germany for you know, 25 euros. It was definitely made in China. If you see nutcrackers that are 75 to 80 euros and you check, those are the ones that are made in Germany. Those would be the ones I think you would want to get if you go to Germany. Um, so there's the more commercial people um, and, and there's some companies that have stands in each market. And then there's the, you know, the home artisans who make their own crafts that display them. And those are the kind of people that we kind of like to go to while you're there, you know, to see the local flavor. Well, I got to tell you, Carter, this is fun doing this with you. <clears throat> when I, when we came up with this idea, I thought, you know, it'll be OK. But, but this is <laughs> really, really working out very well, especially because you're so good at it, at describing things. And well, here, here we have uh, Cologne again. Yeah, Cologne again. This is further down the street. And here's a, a statue. And I can't tell you the what the statue is of. Um, but here's a statue which is in the middle of town, a big granite statue. But in the winter time during the market, they board off streets and they they pour in the water and they have ice skating rinks for the kids. And these ice skating rinks, in this case, went for a couple of blocks. And there's kids that are, you know, skating around. And then there's they've got these the, the bars, you know, these these temporary bars that they erect and one of them was a two-story bar, and you actually have an observation platform. You can look down on all the kids and the people skating. And some it's really funny because sometimes you get like a couple of guys that were like drinking at the bar. And one guy's a really good skater, and he convinces his buddy who's never skated, hey, you can do that. And they go out there, and it's just endless entertainment watching these guys fall. Um, but I just think it's so cool the magnitude that they go to to transform the middle of town, it's like our frog pond, except this is not a permanent structure. This is something that they created. And I didn't have enough uh, photos to, to show it, but uh, at part of this ice skating area, they actually set up curling uh, lanes. You know, and over there, curling is kind of like our bowling. Uh, and they put um, lights underneath the ice, you know, concentric lights. So when you, if you, don't know curling, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you watch the Olympics and you watch curling, you know, it's really cool to see people getting out of work, going down and doing curling matches with their co-workers. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So a couple of questions. Uh, you may find one of them goofy. But um, do you think, you know, if you're like me, when you go somewhere, you're always thinking in the back of your mind, could I live here? Could I live here? Could I just pack up and live here? Could you? Do you think, uh, you know, you do your job a lot of times remotely. I mean, if you can do it remotely from where you do it, why couldn't you go all the way and do it from here? I have a friend who lives a month at a time and does her job from now Mexico City. Have you ever given yeah. thought to, like, all the stuff we don't think about that we would be giving up moving there? Have you thought through this seriously? Like, what do you think? Could you do it? Yeah, I think I could, given certain circumstances. I could do my job uh, from from anywhere if I worked remotely. Uh, we've thought about London. We love London, but it's an expensive city like most big cities are. Um, we happen to love 
towns in Switzerland that we saw that I could live in, you know, and who knows if you could live there for a long time, you know, it's, but you'd never know unless you try it. Right. Right. I, I, I um, fantasize about the possibility of living in Europe. I really do. There may be a lot of nuanced things about living here that, we can't think of, and you would only miss them if you'd been there a while. <clears throat> and you wouldn't have to completely like become a citizen. I, I, you could live there six months and here six months or something like that, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know the rules. I mean, Tina Turner lived in Switzerland for a long time. Eventually, she discovered that she loved it so much, she became a Swiss citizen. So, I mean, there's always that possibility. But yeah, you can still keep your American citizen, citizenship and live abroad for a, a certain term, I don't know how long. Um, I'm sure you have to get, you have to extend visas to stay in a country. Yeah, if you're staying there that long, I'm sure. Um, obviously, you don't have to worry when you're just visiting for a week or two. But um, I'm sure you can get an extended stay visa and stick around long enough to see if you really like it. Yeah, um, it'd be really cool to experience another culture in depth, like really immerse yourself in it. Right. Because like I said, this trip is a Whitman sampler. I have impressions of the culture and the people, but you know, you only really discover the depth of it if you stay there for an extended period of time. Well, Carter Allen, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to send me these photos and taking the time to you know give us a really cool rundown of what your experiences were. Um, I'm really very pleased with this. Thanks so much. Wow. Well, Bradley, my pleasure. It's fun. I was, I was a little worried, you know, when you when you show pictures for the family, everybody, you know, starts to get bored after you get past fifty or sixty pictures, and you know, so we kept it short. And um, it's fun to look at these pictures again. Now I want to look through all of my pictures, but it was a good time. I recommend the Christmas markets in Germany and the Swiss rail trip is just incredible. Will says, "Great show, super photos and comments." I agree. And folks, if you're out there. Do uh, me a favor and share this. That would be a big, big help for me. Carter Allen, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bradley, I love you, man. You take care. I love you, too. And we're ending now. I'm not going to – you'll still be here, but we won't be live. But we're still live now.